What an appropriate way for us to step into what we're talking about today as we culminated our time together last week by landing in Matthew 7. Uh, I love whenever we're stepping into worship here, so many times you may not realize it, but we're just singing scripture and that last song was literally Matthew 7, which is where we left off last week, that idea that Christ is our firm foundation. If we build our house on the rock, no matter the storm rages and tries to tear us down, that we will stand firm. And even in the context of this series, uh, which is aptly named I Heart You, as we talk about this relationship that we have with one another, the thing that you may or may not be gathering is that I am constantly pointing to the greatest romance, the greatest relationship we have, which is God looking at you and saying, I love you, I heart you. And the way he did it is as we look at Scripture is that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He pursued us. And we even looked at it. First week we talked about romance and how he's the author of romance and what that means and then what that means for us in our relationships. And then secondarily, we looked at sex and God's ideal therein and what that means for us. If we're in Christ and we wish to glorify Him with our lives, what is His ideal for us there? And then last week, we talked about the pursuit of romance and what that means for you. The idea of pursuing romance with Jesus, sure, but also in tandem with this idea of pursuing another person. Or if you don't desire to pursue another person, what does that mean scripturally? And uh, this final week, we're landing in a place where we're talking about intimacy. And I'll tell you, I've structured this series a little bit different than I have in the past and than it's typically done uh, from a pastoral perspective. Typically, we create standalone messages that can loosely be tethered to an overarching umbrella. Uh, what I have done is made this incredibly episodic, meaning that we've been building to this moment and all the things that we've been talking about have been entrenched with one another, tethered together, so that there's certainly uh, a certain amount of foundational information you need coming into this one. That being said, you're going to be able to walk into it and be very much with us in what we've said if you're new. But I say that simply to go, it definitely is something that if what we talk about today touches your heart would be of great benefit for you to go back and watch through the other ones that we had because it will only build to what we're talking about today and point to God therein. So with that in mind, that's what we're seeking to do and specifically look at the idea of intimacy in our relationships. And what I realized as I began to build this talk was one, that it was going to be an incredibly cumbersome and difficult talk, which is the way this whole series has felt, by the way. I thought it was going to be like a phone it in love series, if I'm being honest with you. I was like, we'll just talk about love and love at each other. It'll be great. And then I got in the scripture. I was like, come on, God. Uh, like, there's just some rich, deep stuff here and we got to unpack it. And so as we look through those things, intimacy is no different. Uh, but intimacy is very unique. And Honestly, I was going to continue this series for one more week, and I was going to focus on boundaries next week, potentially. But as I developed this message, what I realized is this message is equal parts intimacy and equal parts boundaries. And the reason for that is the first statement that I want to make to you as we begin to dive in. It's simply this, and it's something that you need to bring into your thought process as we're looking at this subject. And it's that intimacy with another person is not dependence on another person, okay? Okay. Those are not the same, and if you're not careful, the more intimacy that you step into someone else and with someone else and alongside someone else, the more that occurs, you will begin to skew the lines between intimacy and dependency on them. Uh, we'll look at all kinds of ways in which that can manifest, but for obvious reasons, where I'm going with that is, as I've said numerous times throughout this series, the only person that can be your firm foundation, that can be your fulfillment, that can be the one that you, to whom you depend in all ways is God, is Christ Jesus and the relationship therein. See, when we look back even at the Old Testament and the beginning of things and the relationship we had with God and just this overall narrative of Scripture, which inevitably is just a giant romance novel of God pursuing relationship and intimacy with us, what we see is that we were in relationship with God in the garden. And by our own decision, we decided to sever that. And what has occurred is a story where God has sought to rectify that over the course of Scripture and ultimately through the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, what we have to understand is that when we were in relationship with an infinite God, an infinite whole was left in the wake of that loss. And you and I try to fulfill and 
throw any number of things into that hole. That could be, uh, you know, just uh, consumption of things. That could be everything from uh, just the entertainment side of things. I'll just look at all these things and I'll disassociate from the world and maybe this will just give me some semblance or whatever. Uh, I'm going to dive in. Maybe it's food for you, right? It's probably food for me. Uh, Or you'll just like really go there to, you know, fill the gap, whatever you've got. And there's any number of ways, right? We all strive for different things to try to feel more whole. But at the end of the day, an infinite whole can be only filled by what? The infinite. Nothing finite can do so. And so we, have, we are seeking that relationship with God. But in tandem, we are in relationship with one another. And the ultimate expression of that from an intimacy perspective is going to be romance. And certainly at the tip of the spear of that is marriage. And so that's what we're looking at today and what that means for us. Now, the thing I want to point out to you that's an interesting one around this conversation of intimacy is that intimacy is not just poignantly and directly black and white spoken about from every angle in Scripture. See, intimacy is multifaceted, and we're going to look at four different types of intimacy in our lives. We're going to look at physical intimacy, which is the most stereotypical one we think of, right? Some of you are probably like, we're talking about intimacy? You said we talked about sex two weeks ago. Why are we talking about it again, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, there's more to intimacy, just so you know, than sex. Just want to get that out of the way. But intimacy comes in a physical form, it comes in an experiential form, meaning just doing life together with someone else. It happens spiritually, there's spiritual intimacy, there's emotional intimacy, intellectual intimacy. And what does Scripture say to these things? Well, the answer is a lot, and at times not much, depending on which side of it you're looking at. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the very direct things that are spoken to, and the things that aren't directly spoken to, we're going to look at Scripture for wisdom. And direction. And you'll see that come out as we do that. To that end, we'll be looking at Proverbs quite a number of times. And I've talked to you about this before, but Proverbs are principles, but they are not promises or ultimately directives all the time. For example, many Proverbs talk about the idea of uh, finances and doing well by your finances. And so what it's saying in there is saying this could go well for you. It is a wise practice, but you're not in sin if you don't do it. For example, like if it was saying something effective, I, I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, if you take more than a 5% loan out, you're in thin. Like that's not, well, you know, right, that would make no sense. But there's things that are wise principles spoken to in Proverbs that in and of themselves aren't statements on whether or not we're misaligned with what God's ideal force would be. But the way that we can take a, le- a litmus test to those things on whether or not they really are directives and precepts is are they spoken to as such elsewhere in Scripture? So we'll see some of that too. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to really bring us in and out of that assessment, which is a little bit of a different place than I typically bring you. Because what I want you to do is I want you to learn how to effectively interact with Scripture and then ultimately make wise application points in your own life. So there's a number of pieces in this message that are very interesting in the fact that you are going to have to decide what the wise line is for you. And it may not look the same as other people's. I know for a fact that mine looks different than others when it comes to some of these things. And I'll even give you some examples therein. But what I'm going to do is give us a little bit of a case study as we dive in to really wrap your mind around everything I'm talking about right now. Of the pointed things of Scripture versus the things that are not as direct and really are left up to wisdom. Uh, And I decided... Uh, that the best way to do that is step headlong into controversy. That's what I'm going to do. So that sounded like a great idea in my mind. It didn't, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, And talk about something that is a a, a very intimate thing that is culturally something that's very common. And the question is, what does God's Word say about it? And what should we do with it? So once again, hear me, not the whole talk about what we're about to talk about, but I am going to use it as an example to make the point of where we're going with this idea of intimacy. So what I'm talking about is living together before we're married. And what scripture says about that? Have you ever had a pastor that bold before? Well, you got one now. Uh, So here we go. And we're going to talk about what God's ideal is therein and where it's vague and where it's direct. And the answer is, is that some parts of it are very direct and others aren't. And I'm going to be very honest with you about that. And you're going to have to figure out what that means for you. So the reason, too, you need to be thinking about things like this is because whether you realize it or not, your children are. So for you, the idea of living together for marriage may be real taboo to you. It may be something that you're like, yeah, of course, like that's what people do. What are you even talking about? It just depends on how you've interacted with it over time. Uh, But I'll tell you this right now, the uh, National Center for Family Marriage and Research did some research and found out that 80% of teenagers expect to cohabitate before they get married. So whether or not you feel one way or another on it, if you've got a teenager, odds are they already are just assuming this is going to happen. And certainly if you haven't had any conversations around it, 
And so it, it matters for us to talk about these things to figure out what God's Word says. So with that in mind, let's look at what that looks like. Well, one, I'll tell you this. We've got to look to the context of what's going on in Scripture and as to why, for example, there isn't a lot about it. Uh, in Scripture, there's next to nothing spoken to with the idea of cohabitation with somebody you're not married to. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Nobody did at that time. And the reason was it was incredibly socially taboo not having anything to do with church, having everything to do with culture at large. So the idea that two people in those cultures at that time would cohabitate prior to living together, uh, prior to marrying each other, is just crazy in the mind of somebody who would be in the church at this time. Uh, the reason would be that, like, for example, they talk about sexual misconduct consistently throughout Scripture, because why? People can, one, step into that behind closed doors in secrecy in such a way that it might not ever even come out. But you can't really hide the fact that you were actively in an ongoing setting living with somebody, right? So that would be something that you would really get vilified in a cultural setting back then. And so you just didn't really see it. So there was really nothing to be spoken of about it in these types of contexts because it just wasn't happening. So if that's the case, then what are we supposed to do in a modern context with it's very common? And how are we supposed to wrestle with that from a scriptural perspective? Uh, don't worry, I, I wrestled with it on your behalf. Uh, <laughs> so with that in mind, the first one that's pretty obvious is what we talked about two weeks ago. And I was very straightforward with you, and if you didn't have a chance to watch that, uh, have at it. But we talked about sex and God's ideal therein. And what we said was is that God has incredibly high standards for your sex life prior to marriage and what that is supposed to look like from a standpoint of withholding from that because he has incredibly high standards for your sex life within the context of marriage and what he wants and hopes aspirationally it will be because of how he made it. And what we're going to see today, the intimate oneness of which we even talked about two weeks ago, that that creates. It's intimacy. Uh, the ultimate culmination of physical intimacy at that. So what we do know is, one, that if we're not married to somebody, we shouldn't be having sex with them. So uh, if that's a part of the situation for you whenever you're stepping into a living with somebody already, that's a pretty good litmus test for you. It's very clear. It's black and white. There's really nothing else about it. Now, I have had... And you, some of you are going to be like, sounds nonsensical. Nobody's actually tried to pitch this to you. You are wrong. Uh, I have had couples that I meet with who talk to me. I ask them for wise counsel. I ask them for feedback and whatever. Uh, don't ask me if you haven't gathered unless you want to know. Because I will answer you. I will answer you biblically and straightforward to the best of my ability. Uh, but they have. And, and they'll say something like, well, Seth, what if we live together? We love each other. We're romantically involved. And we spend all this time together and nobody's around. And, but we just don't have sex. What if we do that? To that I say, <laughs> good luck. Uh, right? That is crazy. Like, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not stupid. Okay, like, you know, like when you spend that much time with somebody you love, that you care about, that you are becoming more and more intimately entangled with, guess what? It's probably yet going to happen. You want to know why? Because God designed it too within the right context therein. It is an expression of the ultimate intimacy. But the problem is, is that at times, because of the way we view marriage, that we diminish what that is supposed to look like ideally. Right? We look at marriage at times as contractual. We look at it as something that is really just uh, a piece of paper. And we, we talked about it a few weeks ago, even that, that we just kind of look at it not through the lens, truthfully, of what God does and what Scripture has to say. I'll, I'll speak more to these things in the cumbersome nature right now. And, and one of the things that uh, researchers have found as it applies to cohabitation is there's something known as the cohabitation inertia effect. And what that is, is instead of intentionally deciding to be fully committed, you're sliding into a commitment. And as decisions are slowly made that are entangling you together more and more. See, what happens is the increase, this increases the pressure on a relationship where you may not be fully committed to that person yet. You're still trying to figure things out, right? You're like, eh, we'll see if it goes the distance. I don't know. We'll find things out. But the moment you feel stuck but not committed, the success of the relationship plummets. Why? Because any number of decisions you're making are not committing you to each other but entangling you to each other more and more. Well, we, you know, it's a financial decision. We're going to go in because it makes more sense, split the rent, all this kind of stuff. Hey, we're going to buy a dog. Like, and if something goes wrong, then I guess you get the dog every other week. I get the, I don't know. Like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to go and, and live abroad together. We're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. 
Maybe if even it's good stuff. Maybe it's like we're going to do this because we even feel spiritually like that we're going to get in the word together and like you're going to use that as a justifier. And you're going to spiritually, interestingly enough, overly entangle yourselves together. And we'll talk about that later too. But the issue is, is that we over entangle ourselves and undercommit because we can, we can just make it end at any point. And the reason for that is, is that in many instances, we are practicing marriage because that's what we're doing. We're practicing marriage and the intimacy that exists therein to see if it's a good fit. But the problem is, is that if you practice marriage, when you feel trapped and when you finally rip yourselves apart from the deep entanglement that you've created and you end it, you're practicing something else. You're practicing divorce. And in and of itself, you find yourself in a place where that idea of marriage is just a thing. And there are checks and balances for what merits removal from that arrangement. That is not what marriage is in God's eyes. It's more than that. And his ideal for you therein is too. See, the issue there is is that contracts are made between people who do have some mutual distrust. Whereas a covenantal relationship, as is outlined for what marriage is supposed to be in Scripture, is characterized by commitment, very intense commitment at that. Uh, right? Contracts are that. And, and when we view relationships as contractual, it, sometimes it's even very much that. Like we'll even get legal stuff involved for a prenuptial. Where we're like, hey, if and when this thing reaches its maturity, we've got this legal safety net for if and when that inevitably happens. Okay? Big, big sign of hoorah on that one. Like, yeah, we're going to make the distance here. But in case we don't, like, right? There's, there's a moment of contractual element that we're bringing to it. And in our society, that's the way it's treated in so many regards. And partly the reason that we're misconstrued in that is our understanding of what a covenant even is, is diminished culturally. Our only context that we have for marriage is that which we know, which is our parents, which is our friends, which is people we interact with. And much of what our understanding is, is formed by that. But can I tell you it's more? Uh, I learned firsthand very intensely what this idea of covenantal relationship was very early on in my ministry career. Been doing this for a hot second, and finally I'd gotten to the point where I was ordained, and people were asking me, friends of mine, to do their wedding. And so two of them stepped forward and said, we want you to facilitate the wedding, and we want you to do something special. Anytime I do a wedding, there's always any number of things that are asked for. Always, you, you got to ask, hey, what are there anything special things in the service, yada, yada. Always something unity. Unity candle, unity sand, plate, whatever. I don't know. Like always unity something. They're going to do it together. It's going to be a whole thing. and be like, no, our lives are like the sands of time come together. I don't know. Uh, it is what it is. There's all kinds of things. But they asked one of the most bizarre requests I've ever gotten. Okay? They said, Seth, we want to put a large red ribbon across kind of the pathway leading up to where you're standing and then uh, the husband and wife, when the wife walks down, she's going to inevitably take the hand of her prospective husband and they're going to step over that red line up to you to make these vows. I was like, cool, I don't, all right, does that mean something? And they were like, oh yeah. And they gave me a lesson in that moment on the depth of covenant and what they wanted to represent within their marriage. You see, they said, Seth, you need to understand that back in old times when it came to this idea of covenant in the Old Testament and, and what that looked like, what occurred was is that individuals would take an animal and they would cut it in half and put one half of it over here and another half over here and put its entrails and blood there in the middle and then they would take each other and they would walk back and forth between this and they would make the statement, if I break this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me. And I said, are y'all going to tell the people in the audience that or me? I drew the short straw. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're here gathered today and this, whew, like it was a rough gig, all right? But I landed the plane somehow and we moved on. I think I mispronounced their name and so nobody was worried about it at that point. I don't know. I screw a lot of things up. But with that, I, it just really shaped things in a new way for me. Why? Because we don't view covenant in a contextual form. When we look at another person, we don't. But the thing that is highly ironic to me is, is we use covenant language when we marry someone, which is very bizarre to me that that somehow has transcended time. I will read to you the most traditional vows that you will walk into if you aspire to be married or have been married. I'll read them to you as if I am the one giving them to Taylor. I, Seth, take thee, Taylor, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, 
That means all the days. That doesn't mean when the contract runs out. That means all the days. For better or for worse, and it's going to get worse real fast, Seth. You need to just understand that. Taylor, you need to understand that. Y'all scored debilitatingly low on conflict resolution in your premarital counseling, and you are really going to hit that ground running hard when you come back from that honeymoon, okay? You just need to know that. For rich or for poor, she married a minister at the onset of his career, okay? Y'all are going to live in some church housing for a while in a little apartment situation, and it's going to be her love for Jesus and not you that gets you through, okay? In sickness and in health. Seth, you're going to have a lot of man colds, and you're going to complain a lot, and she's going to have to put up with it, all right? To love and to cherish, and the most debilitating line that we tether onto it, and I don't know why we do it anymore unless we mean it, and you all know what it is, till what do we part? Another way it's phrased is for as long as we both shall live. And I want to be clear, that's not if she takes a hit out on you, okay? That, to me, that means like... <laughs> We're going to endeavor together in love till we die, not till we kill each other, uh, right? That, that prospect is covenant language. It is until I am no longer breathing, every breath is one in tandem with yours. And what I will tell you is, is that that right there catalyzes the ultimate ability to step into intimacy. Because you can experience intimacy with any number of people in any number of ways. But you cannot fully experience intimacy with one individual until marriage becomes that factor in that regard. Now, the beauty of it, as we're going to see, is that intimacy with God transcends all that, devoid of whether or not marriage is a part of our equation. But when it comes to others, that's how we need to be framing and thinking and approaching. So Genesis 2.23, for example, says this, and we've looked at this one before. But it says, the man said, this is now bone of my bone. This is when Adam looks at Eve when she comes to him for the first time and is presented before him by God. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. I'm going to present to you, as I said, we've been building on the same scriptures even over the course of this series so that we can reflect on them from every angle. This is one of them. And Matthew 19 is another one that we've reflected on. This is Jesus now doubling down on that statement from Genesis 2. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And that last one is even one that makes it into our marriage vows very consistently. See, the first thing I want to make clear to you is this, is that oneness is where romantic intimacy truly begins. Meaning that it's the starting gun for you being able to experience that holistically with another person. You can experience intimacy. With friends and family, you can hang out with them. You can pray with them and experience spiritual intimacy. You can share your pains and your hurts and emotions, and you should. And as we're going to see even in the passages we look at, you are called to do so in Christ. But the ultimate expressions of these things within marriage typically are tethered to the ultimate commitment of marriage. So let's look then at intimacy and what it has to say. This is an interesting passage. So these next two we've looked at before, and now I'm wanting you to frame them through the lens of intimacy. This first one, interestingly enough, you don't think about intimacy when you read it, but it is all over it. So it's Luke 10, 27, which we've looked at. He answered, and this is Jesus responding to the Pharisees about what's like the greatest commandment. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Proverbs 27, 15 through 17 says, a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. And there's a pivot point right there from that reflection on what is not ideal. And I even last week joked about what would be a converse non-ideal with a husband. But there's a pivot point there into what intimacy is supposed to be. And 17 says, is iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So we see in Luke 10 this idea of how we're supposed to love God. With all your heart, that's emotional intimacy. With all your soul, that's spiritual intimacy. With all your mind, that's intellectual intimacy. With all your strength, it's physical intimacy. Your relationship with God 
is supposed to be the most paramount manifestation of intimacy you can possibly have. It's why he's the only one that can truly fulfill you intimately and holistically, okay? It's, it's right there. Beyond that, when we look to each other, the next statement is, hey, look, but that doesn't absolve you from the fact that you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So that's the next step is you need to step into that properly. And right there after that in Proverbs 27, it goes, look, you're not called to just squabble and be all over each other. No, no, no. Like in this negative, non-glorifying, God-glorifying way, you're called to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. See, intimacy at its greatest and God-ordained is refinement. It's coming alongside somebody, loving them well, and pointing them to something that refines them and makes them better, right? If they're thinking through ideas, it's helping them process those in a new way, maybe, into intellectual intimacy. In emotional intimacy, it's helping them maybe even work through the trauma of their past. It's a deeply intimate thing to walk alongside somebody and see refinement come from. There's all kinds of ways. But we've got to ask the question, are we approaching them as such? And are we treating intimacy the way it should be treated? So as we look at this, I want us to dive into these four different types of intimacy and see what it is God has to say. And we're going to see a lot of different things come out. One, the first one I want to point out then is the most obvious and the one that you might have just stereotypically gone to in your mind when I brought up the subject, and that's physical intimacy. So physical intimacy being literally everything from just holding hands all the way to having sex with somebody, okay? What, where, where is that? Where's the line? And what does that look like from an intimacy standpoint, whether it be pre-marriage, in marriage, whatever? Well, let's look at Scripture. So these are going to be some repeats even from two weeks ago. And I got a, a new one for you I'll throw in the mix as well. But 1 Corinthians 6, 18, we looked at flee. From sexual immorality, all their sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Song of Songs 8, 4 says, Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires, which is said multiple times over in Song of Songs. And then that's all the pre-marriage conversation, but then the post-marriage narrative is such that it speaks to the idea that we should be prioritizing that. And you can just go to the whole book of Song of Songs for that one, and it's just all throughout that. We looked at that. And God's ideal for a, a healthy, prioritized sex life. Proverbs 5, 18 through 19 says this, and this is outside of Song of Songs, but this is to make a point that this idea of passion within the context of marriage is not exclusively prescribed to Song of Songs, but finds itself throughout Scripture. Proverbs 5, 18 says, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer, May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. This passionate pursuit of a spouse in this way matters and it needs to matter. And the questions we have to ask ourselves is where, when, and how do boundaries need to come up? So for example, we have to figure out what is and isn't healthy for us. So in marriage, we have to ask the question of, hey, if this is not, and this was the thing we talked about, if this is not mutually and consistently prioritize, that should be a, a, like a red flag of like something's up. Something needs to be assessed. Maybe there's some healing that needs to occur. Maybe there's some stuff that needs to be processed because maybe physical intimacy is not showing itself, but other pieces of intimacy are not there either, which is contributing to it. And you need to create some balance therein. The next step would be looking at the idea of what that means outside of marriage. And here's the thing I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not going to give you some just across-the-board answer. For example, I've had friends who said, you know, for us, we're, we're never going to kiss before we get married. We're, we, because of, in some instances, it's, it's because of where I've been in my past, and, you know, I just know if I go down that road, I won't be able to stop it. So for us, this is a bounding line. Others, it's not that. They just go, this is a commitment we've decided we want to make, and I've watched many close friends of mine step into that in that way. I did not feel called to that personally. Uh, just so you know, that wasn't Seth's line. But some do. Some feel called to that. And that's what you have to decide for you, okay? What we do know is that anything that pushes us into a mental space to where we are lustfully looking at someone in a way that we shouldn't, that that's a problem. We've overstepped a bound at that point. So whatever, if something's causing that, probably something to steer clear of. Obviously, we know sex itself is off the table. But you've got to figure out what the wise thing to do based on the framing of Scripture and what you know will trigger you to what you don't want to do if that's the ideal that you are hoping for. 
So that's one. So it's figuring out those bounding lines. And so the question that exists there is simple. Are you adhering to God's boundaries for physical intimacy before marriage? And are you following God's directives for physical intimacy in your marriage? Which is pretty much just the whole talk from two weeks ago. But nonetheless, it's a big part of this conversation around intimacy. And what I'm going to do at the uh, junction point of each of these four things is I'm going to point out some questions for you. Because one thing that I've realized that has been really great is that a lot of these conversations we've been having have been fostering a lot of conversation in and amongst you. And so what I wanted to do is give you some very just straightforward questions to foster some conversation based on where you find yourself. Spiritual intimacy, that's the next one. And where I'm going to land with this one is probably going to be a little bit different than you would expect from someone who stands in my position. This is everything from praying before a meal when you're eating all the way to literally walking through God's will and directive for your lives as two individuals coming together. This is going through an in-depth Bible study. Right? There's any number of ways in which this can manifest. Matthew 4, 4 to the spiritual things of our life says this. It says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. John 4, 14, whenever Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, he talks about this idea as well. And it says, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The idea is this, is that Jesus is this wellspring of life, is this thing that we need spiritually to fulfill us. Arguably, if you're coming in here and just assessing things and you're like, I don't know how I feel about the whole Jesus thing. Well, one, clearly what you need to understand is that's what I'm pushing you to understand is the ideal representation of all these things, is the relationship with him. And arguably, if you feel like something's missing in your life, in your relationship, or just in your life in general, it's this piece. Spiritual intimacy is something that we need. And when it's missing or improperly balanced, it becomes deeply problematic. I'll speak to that now. So now we're going to shift into some boundary points. Um, oh, no, excuse me. We're going to do 1 John 1, 7 first, and then we'll do that. 1 John 1, 7 says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So what that tells us is that spiritual intimacy, walking alongside each other spiritually matters. And it should matter to us. Now that means both communally in the church, uh, in that sense, and like we're a group, a, a body of believers, as scripture describes it, who have come together. It's very spiritually, this is an intimate space that we come into to spiritually come together and worship God. But it's also individual in the sense of who we walk alongside. And obviously, that's going to manifest in the most intimate relationships in our lives, and certainly in marriage. But what, if any, boundaries lie therein? So Isaiah 2.22 says this, Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Psalms 118.8 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. And Proverbs 28.26 says, Those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. So the questions I want to pose to you in the wake of that, when it comes to boundaries, when it comes to spiritual intimacy, when it comes to prioritizing that properly, are as follows. Is your significant other finding their identity in you, or are they finding their identity in Jesus? That's a problem. That's, that's a bounding line that shouldn't be crossed. Are you finding your identity in the relationship or is the relationship finding its identity in Jesus? Right? You're looking at it and you're a man, my, my identity, my everything. What, it's de- we, we've shifted in that moment from intimacy to dependence. And we've said that's a problematic moment is when we step over that line into dependence in any way. And we can do that spiritually. And then finally, are you prioritizing properly balanced spiritual intimacy in your marriage? Are you prioritizing that? Now, another piece that's uh, uh, interesting there is, is, are you just prioritizing spiritual intimacy at all? That's, that's a pretty much should probably be the first question. Is it present in your life, let alone in tandem with any others? It, it needs to be. And that might be what's the big missing piece for you. But we have to determine those things. We have to figure out where that lands. And so I'm going to give you some advice right now. And I've said it to you guys in the past, but I'll say it again. If you're dating somebody, I would really encourage you to be very cautious of stepping into overly spiritually intimate things with someone you're not ultimately committed to. And the reason for that is, is that if you're not careful, when you begin to walk deeply and spiritually alongside somebody, your spiritual tether point to Jesus will begin to rise and fall on the other person 
and not on your relationship with Jesus. Happens all the time. And even in marriage, you can be really, and that's, I need to extend that uh, beyond the bounds of simply married or not into marriage and saying, that's still not good in marriage. Now, you need to balance that because you absolutely need to have spiritual intimacy. You need to be in depth in the prayer that you have over God's will for your life as they are unified in oneness together. You need to be walking alongside them in the spiritual things and, and vetting those alongside each other. But you got to be careful that you don't overly spiritually entangle yourself to somebody that you are ultimately under committed to. Because you're going you're gonna to find yourself in a rough spot. You're going to find yourself spiritually adrift and lost when the relationship ends. Because you might not realize that the dependency of that relationship was on itself and not on Jesus. Three is experiential intimacy. So another word for this would be anything from social intimacy to recreational intimacy. And this is just spending time with someone. Uh, the more you spend with someone, the more close you inevitably feel to them, right? This is everything from the first coffee date you went on or just hanging out with friends, getting to know them better, all the way to we're going to move to Europe together. Like it's like the most over the top, right? Like let's go, let's make this happen. And then obviously the example we even gave earlier is, you know, we've decided we're going to move in together. We're going to live together. These are all examples of how experiential intimacy comes into effect. Because to get to know someone, you actually have to spend time with them. you got to do stuff with them so that y'all can go, oh, that's right. Like now we've had shared experience, and that is bonding us slowly but surely together. Ecclesiastes 9.9 says this. It says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days, for this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Ecclesiastes being a very interesting study if you've never studied it before. Because it's very much uh, Solomon reflecting on life itself and its fleeting nature, but bringing to the surface those things that matter most therein. And so right here, he's bringing one of those things forward to us and saying, spending time with your spouse and the one to whom your heart belongs matters. And you might ask the question, man, you know, why is it that we don't have physical intimacy right now? Well, do you have any experiential intimacy? Have you done anything with them? Have you been intentional about spending time with them? Like, has that even been happening? What, what, it's, it's, it's an all-in, friend. It's not one and the other. It's not one now and another later. It's all need to be prioritized and balanced in their proper time. So with that in mind, what does that look like for us? Beyond that, how do we create proper boundaries therein when it comes to our time and the way that's working and what we are doing with our time. Proverbs 16, 9 says this. It says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So the question has to be presented to us then is in what we are doing is what we are doing what God would have us to do. And as an individual follower of Christ, you have to make that decision. And when you are in a covenantial, intimate oneness marriage with another person, you have to decide together, are you doing the things that you need to for God? Like, I, I mean, really, truly, just like holistically, like, are you feeling led that you need to open up your home as a married couple to other people and be hospitable and bring them in. It's very scriptural. It's very biblical. Are, are you feeling led that you're, as a household, aren't supposed to be here anymore and you're supposed to move somewhere else and, and God may be directing you in that way and that's where you need to be investing your experience and your time? What does that look like? And the greatest question of all is, and I think this one is the one we just naturally tend to get the most because when it comes to each other, but we miss it when it comes to God. Because there's this logical place of like, duh, if I want to have intimacy with somebody and get to know them better and grow closer to them, I have to spend time with them. Yet for some reason, we throw that out the window when we talk about the desire to have intimacy with God. We say, he's the number one priority in my life, heart, soul, mind, strength, all the above. But when we're actually pushed on if that intimacy is something that we are living out from the time we are spending with him, we'll commit to Sunday. But when it comes to the rest of our week, eh, maybe. And yet, for some reason, we wonder why we don't feel close to him. We wonder why we're not walking intimately with him. The answer is because we're not walking with him. We aren't spending time with him. So the questions I present to you are this. 
Are you making overly intimate plans with someone you aren't ultimately committed to? Are the plans you are making God's plans? And are you prioritizing properly balanced experiential intimacy in your relationship, whether that be married or not? And more than anything else, I don't have it on there, but it, it needs to be said, are you prioritizing experiential intimacy with God and walking with Him and spending time with Him if you want to foster that relationship for everything it is meant to be? Finally, we have intellectual and emotional intimacy, more or less two sides to the same coin, very different, but coming from similar places at some times. So this is everything from sharing ideas about things you like and expressing surface-level emotions to challenging each other to think about things in a new way or work through deep emotional and personal trauma alongside someone. Those are deeply intimate things to do. So the question is, what do we do about that? Well, Galatians 6.2 is pretty straightforward. It says this. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So devoid of marriage or not, we're called as followers of Christ to come alongside each other and carry each other's burdens. That's mentally, that's emotionally, it's it's all the above. You're supposed to care about other people, let alone the most intimate relationships you have in your life. It should matter to you. If your spouse is in an emotional upheaval, if you aren't stepping into that and showing care, empathy, and affection therein, that is a problem. And you are ignoring emotional intimacy. If you are refusing to share where your emotions are with your spouse, what you have done is created an emotional barrier that is creating tension where intimacy should be. Now be careful. As I've said, we need to make sure that we inevitably have boundaries therein. Now I will tell you, one of the greatest and most intimate things you can do within a relationship is what Ephesians 4.32 says, which is this. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in Christ forgave you. It is an incredibly intimate thing to rip open your chest, make yourself incredibly vulnerable and look at someone who you care about who has wronged you and say, I forgive you. That's love. You wanna know how I know it's love? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He forgave us because he loves us. Let's talk about some boundaries. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Uh, We cannot take the emotional and mental weight of our lives and exclusively dump it on the shoulders of someone we care about. Married or not. That, that is not something they are capable of carrying. They might try to for a while, but they will buckle. But there is one who wants to carry every one of your burdens and to lay them down at his feet. So be careful. Set up a boundary. Make sure that you're not allowing your relationship to be just an emotional dump. It doesn't mean you shouldn't process. It just means you should process together in a healthy manner and give it to God. Here's your questions for that one. Are you allowing yourself to become emotionally or intellectually entangled with someone you aren't ultimately committed to? Are you emotionally or intellectually dependent on your spouse or anyone for that matter? Are you prioritizing properly balanced intellectual and emotional intimacy in your relationship? Are you you balancing those things? Are you bringing that into effect? Are you leaning into wisdom where that is appropriate? and setting out boundaries. As I've told you, with each of these, almost all of them, you've got to figure out what the line is for you and the balance point so it doesn't tip over into where it's not supposed to be. Where it's not supposed to be is pretty clear. But you've got to figure out where you have to set up boundaries so that you can be empowered to take those steps effectively. That's what it means to step into intimacy. That's what it means to give it to God. And if we can do those things, it it will change things. If we can do that in our friendships, it will change things. And I can tell you right now, if if we can just get a handful of marriages that prioritize all the things that I've been talking about these last few weeks, it will reverberate throughout our community. 
And can I tell you what I've been trying to speak to you in all this? And I hope you've heard my heart over the course of these four weeks. I even spoke to it in the last couple of weeks. The scripture says, look, any of these precepts and, and directives of God to the follower of Christ should never be burdensome. So if it is coming across as a burden, then, then something's off. Because as a follower of Christ, our desire should be for him. And my hope is, is the way that I have framed this to you is that his ideal for you isn't a burden. It is good. And it is for you. It is for your relationships. And if you'll step into that, it can be a game changer for you. So don't do it because you feel it's a box to check in your mind or a moralistic thing to align yourself with. If you're a follower of Christ, do it because you know that his desires for you are for you and not against you. To prosper you and not to harm you for yours, for a hope and a future. So let's pursue that directive of romance and intimacy in our relationships. Let God take care of all the rest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you that you are good. I want to thank you that above all else, you are everything we need. You are the ultimate intimacy of our lives. We don't, we don't need marriage. We don't need other things without you. We just need you. And all the other things will never be to the fullest extent of what they can without you. So align our hearts with yours. Have us pursue that which you would have us for your glory and your purposes because we know it's for our betterment and not our destruction. Not to be a burden upon our shoulders, but to lift all the burdens from our shoulders. May we intimately walk with you, Jesus.